Welcome to Goalie Science, the podcast that bridges the gap between goal setting, science, and peak performance. I'm your host, Jamie Phillips, a former professional goalie, currently pursuing a doctorate in physical therapy and specializing in goalie performance coaching. Joining me as always is Dr. Ben Cernick, a seasoned goalie coach and sports analytics specialist. Whether you find yourself at home, on the road, or at the rink, grab a cup of your favorite beverage and let's drop the puck on this week's episode. Jamie, I don't like not doing the intro. Every I time know, you start I, now, I don't like we, it. We went, what, 49? Like 50, 50 episodes, episodes or something? Yeah, with you doing yeah. the intro, and now it's just kind of like this awkward. You know, it's, it's, you know what it is? It's like a cold open. Just a straight yeah. up cold open. Um, ben, we are back. It's another week. I am back at my parents' house. For those that are watching on YouTube, you can always tell by the Hendrik Lundqvist and Carrie Price posters in my childhood room. Let's go. Hold on, we never talked about how good TPS equipment was in the early 2000s. Okay, what so a missed opportunity. Was it? This is my thing. So I never wore it. And I remember Matt Clark, uh, he used to own on ice goaltending back in the day. He had some TPS pads, but I remember yeah, I remember wanting TPS because of how it looked when Lundquist wore it. So I don't Correct. know, was the gear actually good or just did it look, did we all just want to look like Lundquist? We were children. There's no way to answer this. We were, we were we were simply children at the time. So if you if you wore TPS back in the day, let us know in like the comments uh, on the YouTube or I don't know. Can you comment on Spotify? You can sure. rate on Spot. Speaking of ratings on Spotify, <laughs> we have a lot of we have some good ratings. So thank you to everyone who took the time to rate us on Spotify and iTunes. We really appreciate that. It does help the pod. Um, so and if you want to help boost the pod, just give us a rating. Um, TPS baseball gear and goalie pass yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's like the uh it's like the old joke where it's like hey i really want a a, a piano well do i know the company people what if i also want a motorcycle and that's oh. when you go to yamaha yeah they honestly do musical instruments and very fast motorbikes really well and you know what i think they do like boat engines too they're just oh yeah probably you know what they did is they just made like a mind map and we're like what Okay, so we're making pianos. Pianos have parts. What else has parts? <laughs> and then they just like they just drew it out. <laughs> and that's our new recurring segment talking brand awareness. Uh, brand awareness and marketing strategies with two guys that need help with brand awareness and marketing strategies. Uh so we were talking about well, we were discussing what we were going to talk about earlier. Uh and then I put out uh, an older video yesterday on my Instagram. And it was about puck decisions and how I don't like when goalies rim the puck. Um, I actually talked to Eric Comrie, message, texted me after that. And he said he does, he, his goalie coach, his personal goalie coach, Lyle Mast, says he doesn't like when the pucks cross the hash marks, which I agree. But he says, even at the NHL level, there's very little detail to what goalies are doing when it comes to playing the puck. It's almost like an afterthought. And we had talked in our previous episode, our one year anniversary episode about things that kind of grind our gears and these mm -hmm. coincide. So before we get into what grinds our gears and our topic, just to reiterate, um, I ran the numbers in college hockey using Michigan tech, and this would have been two or three years ago. And every time the goalie went behind the net and they chose to rim the puck, like hard rim, whether that was forehand or backhand or glass and out, as most people will say it, um, we ended up turning over the puck. I think it was about 75% of the time, uh, roughly oh, yeah. 75. I think it came out to like 73 or something. So obviously I'm going to round up. Um, then when we changed our system or I told the goalies that whenever they're behind the net, if they don't have a clean pass option, they need to soft chip it to the corner to create a 50, 50 puck battle. Once we started yeah. doing that, our defenseman or forward, whoever was there supporting came out, with the puck 80% of the time. So you went from turning it over 75% of the time to then coming out with puck possession 80% of the time. And if we think about why we play the puck as goalies, there's a couple a couple purposes. The first is keep our defensemen safe. Second, to beat F1 to create an odd man rush. And the third biggest one is just to make safe plays 
to buy time for us to get back in the net and regain possession. So maintain and regain possession. So if we're doing regaining possession 80% of the times, that's exactly, exactly what we want. Now, you'd think that more NHL teams, and to be honest, a lot of pro teams, like from my experience in the American League and the in the coast and Europe, we didn't really talk a whole lot about what you do when you get back behind the net. It's more like, well, you figure it out, make a pass, don't turn it over, or hey, our D are gonna fan out. And then that's kind of like the end yep. of the story. Then you're expected to like somehow make these decisions. Um, ben, one of the things that grinds your gear is the lack of involvement between goalie coaches and mm -hmm. the head coaching staff when it comes to defensive zone structure and puck handling. So I'd love to get you going on a rant about this. We'll start with puck handling. Like, let's just keep it, keep it kind of rolling. We'll talk about okay. the zone structure after, but like, yeah. Everything you just said is exactly exactly my philosophy. And I think we can learn, as goalies, we can learn a lot from the statistics on forwards and, and D when they dump the puck in, when they put pucks off glass and what actually happens, right? So hmm. if you look at something like forwards entering the offensive zone, carrying the puck in with possession in the offensive zone is like three and a half times more valuable than dumping the puck in, right? Because when you dump the puck in, you lose possession temporarily, right? You might yeah. regain it. Right? You might read it, you might not. So the same thing applies to us as a goalie when we rim the puck. When we rim the puck, we might get possession. Right? But what's what's the most realistic best case scenario? The puck gets out of the zone and now it's a neutral zone battle because we're not rimming it with the intent of beating a forward and a D to get a winger on a breakaway. Right? We're rimming it so that we can get back in the net and figure it out from there. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. So you're you're actively turning the puck over more more often than not. And mm -hmm. right, wingers already have a really hard time picking pucks off the boards, right? Like even if a, a D rims the puck, a winger, some wingers are gonna have a hard time picking that puck off the board cleanly. So now mm -hmm. we're gonna rim it glass height, rim like board height, and are expecting a winger to to able to handle that. So I'm with you entirely. The data supports that too. Is again, like your your information is great there, but the other data on rimming the puck is like it, it almost always just goes to their D. It very rarely gets out. Even I don't care how good of a puck handler you are. It's, it's you're turning the puck over more often than not after you've had possession. Uh, and so that's why I'm always like when, when coaches are asking their goalies to be, you know, out there getting the puck, stopping the puck, moving the puck. It's like, well, yes, if we can go stop it cleanly, retrieve it for our D, that is awesome. Stop it, get out of the way. That's great. That's exactly, I said, if I not, cut you off, I think that oh, that's what most coaches mean when they said they want their goalies to be active with puck handlers. And they, they mean, they mean get the puck off the boards so the defenseman can pick it up quickly and get out of the way so the defenseman can continue, you know, going, wheeling around the net. Yeah. I would say most coaches don't actually care if you are a truly good puck handler, if you're the Mike Smith or if you're like a no. Marty Turco. They just want you to be confident at going back, picking it up, making a very small pass, like 10, 20 feet, not even 10, 20 feet, like 10 feet I, or less. Yeah. And then getting out of the way so that they can get out of the zone faster. I think, and so this is where, this is really where my take goes in. I think a lot of the time that to do that with pressure is harder than people realize. Oh, so hard. To go out and stop the puck, right? I think, all, think of all the times in your life, in your coaching life, in your playing career, where you've gone to play the puck behind the net. You've pulled it off the boards as the D is being forechecked, and there's like this half collision with you. There's like, oh, this, yeah. where do you go? There's no space, right? And so where I kind of came from is by with with that aggressive of a forecheck, that puck is rarely picked up cleanly by the defenseman. Either mm -hmm. way, if you stop it or not, whether it goes into the corner because you didn't go and stop it, or if the D picks it up because you did, and you're <laughs> trying to get out of the get back. I think those like really tight four check situations. I, as a goalie coach, don't care if the goalie goes and stops it. Cause I don't think the clean possession happens nearly as much as we think it does when the goalie does play it. Like, I think if he lets that puck rim around, vocalizes like, Hey, far side, far side, the team can get back and get into a 50, 50 can go pick up the puck up in the corner. I'm not always so, so, so upset. if the goalie doesn't stop it behind the net in that situation. I'm like, I'm more of a, eh, it's, it, it's not yeah. going to be a clean pickup. I'm more of an you know it I mean? depends. Like, I think it depends yeah, a lot on the scenario. <laughs> um, of course, it. I think for me, it's just like how hard that rim is. If that puck's probably going to die 
a little bit on like the the opposite side than that so say it's rimmed on your goalie's glove side and it's pretty soft and it's going to stop on the kind of like just past the the midline of the net on the blocker side for me i'd say it's probably better to do it because then your defensemen don't have to go straight into the boards if it's a hard rim and it's going to wheel up and start go passing the opposite corner i would say yes you could probably let it go um right the I thing is that's too what, is that's like kind of what i'm talking about yeah the, the, and we had talked about puck handling being overrated, and I 100%, 100% agree that it's overrated. And I, I I don't mean that like you shouldn't go play the puck. I want goalies to yeah, be sure. good at playing the puck. You should be good. You should be able to pass hard. You should be able to shoot hard. Uh, you should be able to l- understand head checks and get back quickly and make good plays and be able to rotate and get your chest up ice when applicable. But where I, where I struggle and I get a lot of frustration from is when I get goalies and I'm talking to them because I interview like a lot of goalies that apply for like my my elite goalie method program and or like talking to younger kids and doing scouting reports and all these things and I always ask like what what do you need to work on like I want because I ask that because I want to know how self-aware is this goalie how well do they know their game like I I know what they need to work on. Like I, I saw them play. Like I know what they need to work on. It's not about me. It's rebounds it's about, and puck handling, right? That's what it yeah, is. Exactly. And it's about, and I want, I ask that question because I want to know, can this player have that self, like an objective awareness about their game, be honest with themselves and be able to articulate it in a way that's, you know, under, shows me that they understand the game. And it honestly, like I would say, Nine times out of ten, it always comes out to puck handling and rebound control. And we talked about rebound control. We talked about how rebounds, good rebound control is a symptom of good positioning and good tracking. Puck handling, it doesn't really matter that much in the grand scheme of things. No. <laughs> it matters. For me, it's how I'd rather someone be a smart puck handler than a highly skilled puck handler. Because if they're a smart puck yep, handler, they're going to make the smart decisions. Highly skilled. I don't mind. Like, I, I don't care that Mike Smith does all these things. It, the thing is, too, is he's going to do them because he's confident in his yeah. abilities. That also means that he's going to turn them over. And that's, an, that's, that's a risk the team has accepted. Whereas when I look at it, too, if I have a goalie, I would rather them make safe plays, be about 98% on all their plays, and really just be like a quiet, no one's no one goes out of their way and be like this guy's great. This guy or girl's a great puck handler. But that's that's just me. I do think it is overrated, but I also think that if you're a goalie listening and someone asks you that question, think deeply about what you actually would like to improve upon your game. It's okay to say, like, hey, like I really struggle on screens. I really struggle on like two on ones. I I guess like it's okay to do that, especially when a goalie coach asks you, because that's the stuff that they can work on to get better. Whereas if you just say puck handling, most goalie coaches don't want to work on puck handling. We will when needed. It's fine. But it takes, it shouldn't, to teach someone how to go back to the net hard, they either had to get their head up ice, isn't that valuable to the long, as valuable to their long-term development as say, understanding how to read plays and adjust your depth and all these things. And that's why I think it is currently overrated in the grant like the overall zeitgeist of goaltending talk yeah let me give you a really quick analogy i think that'll tie this one off with a bow is that people think goaltending playing the puck is really important the same way that people think face-offs and a a centerman's face-off skills are really important go watch a game and there's data that supports this but go watch games and see how often a face-off ends in what's called like a 50 50 situation and see how often, regardless of what team wins it, how quickly it is then turned over again. And you'll be surprised to see that possession off face-offs is a lot less clear and a lot less valuable than you think. And that's where I view puck handling for a goalie. Where like, if you are an excellent puck handler, that is a great, it's a, it's a plus, it's a plus, but it's not a necessity, right? Yeah, it, it's, if yeah, you are, it's, it's, a, it's a luxury sorry. skill. <laughs> Yeah, right. And if so, and if I have two goalies who are perfect in everything, they are the exact same skill level of every single thing. 
There's no difference between them. And one is a better puck handler. Sure, that person is a little bit better at something and that might be valuable, right? But there's so many other things and other requirements, other prerequisites that we need from goalies before we care about being an elite puck handler. You still need to be a competent puck handler. Yes. You still need to be able to get behind the net, hold the puck off the boards, get back in the net. That's something you need to do, right? We're not saying don't do that. We're saying mm-hmm. there are, it's like those like really hard, tight in zone dump in plays. We don't need goalies to get those. It's okay mm-hmm. to not get them, um, right? And so that's kind of how I view that, James. Does that make you on the online with that one? Yeah, uh, I guess I didn't know the stat about about um, faceoffs, and honestly, I thought faceoffs were more important um, than you just said. But it does make it, it makes sense that it's like one of those things where if you are good at it, it's a it's good. But you don't have to like go out of, like, if you're like a winger, you don't have to go out of your way to become really good at taking that one draw you may get a game because statistically it doesn't really matter. But like again, if you're goalie and there are like a lot of flaws in your puck stopping ability or a game, like don't you don't have to go out of your way to build up your ability to pull the puck and be good. Sorry, a good puck handler, not competent. I like that the difference between like a skilled puck handler and a competent yeah. puck handler when you need to actually work on a lot of things when it comes to actually stopping the puck. Um, because like, you just look, even look at an NHL game with, I would say that's like normal, goal, like normal goalies that are good at puck handling, like eliminate the Mike Smiths and the guys that really like to take risks. Look at their puck handling choices in the game. Go behind the net, stop, set. Go behind the net, hard rim. Go behind the net, pass. That's it. Very That's rarely it. <laughs> do they come out and they make like these big sprawling, like massive stretch passes. And the thing is too, is if you want, if you want to make you, if you say like, I want to have the skill to make those plays, then yes, if you really want go to do it. that, go for it and learn. And we as coaches will help you with that skill. But you have to understand that again, it's a, that's a luxury skill. It's not something that's going to exactly put you over the top, the creme to the crown. And most of the time when we make stretch passes, it's because there's like a, a it's because it's like a shorthand, you're on a power play and there's a change and you're going to make that pass. So there's not a lot of pressure. If you want to start making those passes under high danger, you, you can, but you also need to run that by your coaching staff because if you were like, hey, I love playing the puck and I'm going to play the puck, sometimes the coaches are like, no, we don't want you to take that chance. Yeah. And then they're, then that skill gets You're on the same page with your team. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, this is, this is all coming from someone who had a – I had more points um, than some of the players on my team one year. You were a good puck uh, I would. Yeah, I used, to make the, I used to make the big stretch pass all you the did, time. Yeah. And – Honestly, as I've gone away from it, uh, like I used to do it all the time. I would send guys on two on ones, breakaways, just because again, I good. I was a good skater, so I get out, play the puck, and move it quickly. But ultimately, like that's, I still think that stretch pass a lot of times is not really a good play. How many times do we see that stretch pass go up, and by the time it gets to the forward, the other team's collapsed on the person, and it's or just the, a turnover. The forwards have to that happens a lot. And they have to regroup when they could have adjusted it. So it. It, it's, it is, it is a, yeah. a lot of those like strong, this more nuanced than we might be giving it credit for, but the overall arching skill is that, yeah. or, or I guess the theme is that being an excellent puck handler in terms of stick handles and stretch passes and all these things isn't that important in the grand scheme of goaltending. And you can go and play in the NHL and just be, as long as you are a competent puck handler at getting behind the net, taking a yeah. look, making the safe play, you but you are nhl level at solving box you will get to the nhl it's one of those skills where it's like hey if you really if you want to take the time and go in your garage and and like do all these things 100 although i do say like a lot of goalies like you need to learn how to shoot the box so go in your garage and shoot box because that is an important skill yeah i mean okay but it's the risk but this is not what we're saying i know yeah like right again like this is it's the situational adaptation of that you need and look there will be times the goalie where the other team will make a terrible play and dump the puck in on you on a, on their power play. And you have a chance to get the puck down the ice on a PK. If you can do that, that is sweet. If you have the ability to make that play confidently and safe, right? An amazing ability to have a very, 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 very small time, like small percentage of play that happens, Yeah. right? Especially as you climb up the levels of hockey, you get better and better hockey, less and less and less teams are putting pucks anywhere near goalies, mm-hmm. right? Like we just yeah, we, you're, you're trying not to rim. You actually try not to rim for those like if you right if maybe have never been in like a like a high level dressing room like even junior and higher but you're, you're told not to rim 
you're told stop ship in the yeah. corner because you don't want to give it to the goalies because you as a forward team, you also want to the forechecking team you want to create that 50 50 battle or you want to be that f1 so you get the defenseman turning so you yeah. can so you can get in there quickly and then reg- get, regain possession because you give it up but yeah, so if I can summarize all this, I'd say, like, again, it's, it's you need to be a confident puck handler. You need to be able to stop the puck, you need to be able to pass the puck, you need to be able to shoot the puck, right? Mm-hmm. But your decision-making around how you go and do that in a game will look a lot different than the skill set that you practice on your own time and in practice. And I think being a smart decision-maker around when to go out and stop pucks, when to go out and shoot pucks, is much more valuable than the physical ability to do so. Um, it's the thought process behind it. And I think that's really relevant. Right. But I wanted to transition this because I think it ties directly into our second thing, which is the goaltender's role in the defensive zone Mm -hmm. and how much a goal, the way a goalie plays, could influence your defensive zone. And also, if you're a goalie whose team plays a rigid defensive zone, how you need to adjust to the defensive zone structure that your team plays. Right. Like it's, it's either one or the other. I think it should be a combination where the defensive zone works with the goaltender as part of, okay, how does our goalie succeed the most? What's our goalie efficient at? And then the destructure can kind of work around that. I've talked a little bit about that in Toronto's system, like Maple Leafs with someone like Ilya Samsonov, who's an excellent straight line puck stopper uh, and pretty good down and tight, but not so great moving laterally at distance. That's just where he struggles. Again, NHL caliber goalie, first round NHL draft pick. Uh, but this is not slander. He's very good. <laughs> but... Jamie, I want to kind of get your mind on your thoughts from your experience as a coach, as your experience playing, how playing in different D zones changes how you play. And then as goalies, at times when you're like, I hate our D zone structure and this makes my life miserable. And I can think of lots of times from my playing days too of watching that happen. Yeah. It's actually, it's, it's funny that we, that this conversation comes up because it's very similar to the one that we, we talked about where goalies, some goalies thrive in different, different D zone structures. Um, I think it's a very important ultimately it's very important for the goalie to understand which what is going on like what yeah. is supposed to happen so you can start to identify early this is not happening the way that's supposed to happen I need to be ready for a possible shot because things are not happening the way they're supposed to happen um and I was super guilty of not paying attention in any sort of structure talks or stuff because I didn't think it was important I look back now and I'm like oh, I, I I'm dumb. Like I should have paid more attention. Like you said, the board. No one like, does drill. though. You don't look at the drill. You don't like. You don't do these things. And the coach will be like, you want you pay attention. You're like, oh yeah, for sure. But it's you need to understand like how your defensive D zone, like your D zone structure, so that you know if you want to be that goalie that makes those confident plays, you need to know where those guys are supposed to be, and you need to understand that okay, if this is the four check, this is going to be our back check and this is how we're going to structure it so i need to be ready it's like okay this 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 and you it just makes you an overall better well-rounded goalie and ultimately that's the most important part is the smarter you are usually the more pucks you're going to stop and so that's why i really i I agree and i agree that you need to understand that stuff and you will thrive if you understand it versus if you don't yeah, let me give you an example that I think is really important from a from a let's say you're a goalie that's you're you know you're the D zone structure is not built around you. You're a junior goalie, a minor hockey goalie. That is probably, I mean, honestly, college goalie. Uh, very, very few teams I think actually are doing this. I think it'll change, but you know, I'm not sure this is a full consideration quite yet. But if we look at again, minor hockey, junior, if you don't know where your center is swinging on a breakout you don't know where the turnover and where the small chances can emerge. So for example, if you're a team that ha- doesn't have a low center swing on a breakout, right? Your team does a switch at high, doesn't have low center support. If there is a two person four check coming at your D hard, that turnover is going to turn into a small little one on O two on O in tight a lot of the times in the year, because your team will turn that puck over. Mm-hmm. Right? So you need to know regularly that, okay, my D is now stepping out of the corner. I need to be ready because this is the, like the the pinpoint the the funnel point where there might be a turnover and there might be a scoring chance on me i'm super super guilty of not doing that when i was playing as well Uh, there's a picture of me somewhere where my d was stepping out in a breakout and i'm standing on the middle of my net 
in the goal line because it's, it's like just my D stepping out. There's no one around. I'm like, oh, this can't possibly go wrong. And he just fires it into a shin pad off the forward and it goes in right beside me. And the picture is me staring at the puck going by my foot, standing there, right? Had I actually known that, oh, or had I actually thought, oh, on this breakout, we always fly the, the short side. Yeah. So he's he's going to shoot the puck or he's going to make a move. So either way, he's going to shoot it and there it could hit turn over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's the choke point. Right. So understanding like your breakout structure. Now, again, I'm a really big proponent because I let in that goal and I never was the same actor. I'm a really big proponent that you need to follow your breakout properly. Goalies don't do this. Right. Your team's breaking out and they just sit in their goal line and they stare just like I did and let in a goal. Right. Yeah. But you should be actively engaging in that breakout process. Doesn't mean like be a foot outside your crease. You probably shouldn't do that anyway, but at least be square, at least be in the right spot. Yeah, I was just saying, that's like, my, that's I, originally I was like, goalie coaches need to be more dialed, which we, I think we do. Um, it's yeah. always, it's always an awkward like, conversation because sometimes coaches just like, usually go, as a goalie coach, and you're oftentimes in, in dressing rooms and you are 100% the afterthought. Like, yes. no one cares. As long as your goalie makes saves and then it's like, like <laughs> oh, okay, you do what you do. And the goalie has a great game. You're like, oh yeah, a great game. They have a poor game. Then everyone looks at you like, what? you like you're supposed to have answers for some 14 year old you're like I, I i don't i don't know man they probably had a volleyball game at school i don't know um it was a hard day yeah like yeah hard. but like but i think it's the goalies themselves need to take more initiative and be involved in paying attention to that structure um from a young age student structure starts to get implemented so around probably 12 13, 13 they start 14, to sprinkle yeah. it in there a little bit just pay attention understand if you don't know ask and if the coach says like, well, you're a goalie, you don't need to know. Just be like, well, I want to make sure that I'm always ready just in case. And I think that that should be a good answer, good enough for, for the kids. And if and then if you don't know, ask your goalie coach. And then if the goalie coach, if we don't know, we need to go learn and do, which means we got to do our homework to be able to figure out uh, figure out that stuff. And also, if you're a goalie coach listening it, and you want to move up into the ranks, understanding system and structure does help because certain levels will hire an assistant slash goalie coach. So if you can yep. both understand structure and also goalie coach, it does make you a lot more valuable because most teams don't have the budget for an extra full-time goalie coach, but they have the budget for someone and they're look actively looking for someone who does, who does both. And so that's very common. Yeah. And so it's, again, it's really, really valuable. I think a lot of the time, if I could like put it in order of understanding your structure as a goalie, understanding the D zone that you play in, First thing you should need to completely understand is your power play and where the weak points are in your power play, right? You have less people yes. on the ice, yes. more lanes open up. You need to understand what type of chances your team can give up. You also need to know what type of chances your team's going to give up depending on who's on the ice, mm-hmm. right? You can have the best, you can have, everyone knows this. They played with a, a, an unreal penalty killing forward who is just a little buzzsaw, takes away lanes. And you know that where they're on the ice, there's nothing getting through that backdoor diagonal because they take great lines of pucks. But- yep. You know, if they're taking away that lane, that means there's probably a shot lane. So it's like, okay, first PK units on the ice, right? Mm -hmm. Backdoor becomes less of a threat. Short side becomes more of a threat. How do I adjust my game for that? Conversely, you know, you switch that situation. Second PK unit comes out, okay. You know, they kind of just go up and down through the shooting lane, which means now you're dealing with one more traffic. But two, if you're just in the shooting lane, the pass on is open, right? So those are things that you need to understand. I should be able to go to a goalie again, like I said, probably after, after U15, I really want this. And they should be able to walk me through exactly what everyone's doing on the PK. That's what I expect. If you want to act like, you know, you should tell me exactly what we're doing on the PK. Uh, and that's, you know, this is a shout out to coaches too, to include your goalies in the PK, D coaches, whatever, whoever you want to do, include your goalies in the PK. All right. So PK it's- is probably the most important defensive structure thing. Five on five is again, understanding general principles. And then definitely, definitely understand your breakout system because you are part of the breakout. We just talked about puck handling, but you are part of the breakout system. You need to know where people are going to be, where they're supposed to be, and where stuff goes wrong. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I hundred. I, I agree. There, there's a lot that goes into it. So it's accountability from coaching staff and goalies just to make sure everyone gets involved. And I think it's it's on for, for listening as goalies. We're not just goalies, and yes, it does suck that we need to. Now, like not only do we have to be good at stopping Pox and all these other things that forwards don't really have to worry about, but now we also have to understand the same systems, but that is the responsibility that we have. And we are the most important person on the team. Like that's not, we're not just saying that because we're goalies, like we ultimately are. 
we if there was if there is one person who can really control whether a game is won or lost it is us as the goalies similar to the way like in basketball and football like the quarterback or like you know the big dogs on a basketball team can dictate the game that's us as goalies we have the most influence so we need to be the smartest we need to be the smartest people on the team yeah and, and it's like a when you say smartest, it's yeah, it's smartest in the hockey sense term, right? Yeah. I don't need you to be able to do linear algebra. I, mean, I would know. like if you could do my homework for yeah, me. Yeah, I would like if you could help me with my linear algebra. But you need to understand, again, that the environment that you're playing, right? I always go back to this. Uh, like, again, Vegas just won a cup last year. They played a wonderful defensive system in front of Aiden Hill, right? Aiden Hill, big goalie, stays deep in his net. Uh, and they just, again, they worked around him. But... Let's give Aiden Hill credit. He understood the system that he played in, which allowed him to be aggressive on certain things, right? Mm -hmm. He's I can get out of position on this backdoor save because I know that my team collapses to the house every single time the puck goes low, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we talk about the importance of being these amazing skaters. And yes, go be the best skater you can be as a goalie. You need to be. But Aiden Hill, who's not the best skating goalie in the NHL, knew that he could get away with certain things with that team in front of him. And that is a, such an important skill that I don't think, and again, I would not say that I was the best uh, Aiden Hill supporter in the playoffs, but again, like what an accomplishment and what an incredible job he did. He just got paid a lot of money for it, so shout out to him. But again, did really well in that system and understanding what he could get away with and what he can't. And I think that's where we see a lot of times when I talk to goalies who are saying, oh, you know, like, what am I going to do? My team doesn't take the, doesn't take the man in front of the net on the rebound. It's like, well, you know, they're not going to do that. You have to. Yeah, I love that. It. I I love when goalies answer their own like this is anything in life, but I love especially in goal setting. Like, I love when goalies are like, oh, my team just always turns it over and gives up breakaways. And then my answer, my, my reply is always, okay, yeah, and well, they're like, we give up a lot of breakaways. Like, okay, so that what does that mean for you? Like, mm, what are we working are on? You're not getting this. Like, okay, like we need to be better at breakaways. Yep. So yeah, breakaways yeah. like are a skill itself. So let's hammer them home and let's let's not do well. I do like to do the difference between actually that's been saved for an episode, difference between shootouts and breakaways, but it's like, okay, <laughs> you need to practice that. Like that's the self-awareness that I was talking about before. Like, wake up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? If you are as a goalie, and this I think will kind of tie off this episode here, but if you're a goalie and you're seeing my team always does X. And that's why I'm getting scored on. Make the adjustment. Mm. Right? You can have, that's your responsibility in your D zone. Right? Yes, your team should tie up sticks. Yes, your D need to go through the player's hands when they're tying up sticks and not just reach and stick lift. Yes, we can teach the D to do that, the forwards to do that, how to properly pick up players. But if they're regularly not picking up players, and you're getting scored on the same way and not making that adjustment, that is on you. I had a really great conversation with one of my goalies this week. Um, they had a, a, a tough game. Like, let honestly, they let eight goals, and I watched all eight of them, and I was like, oh, it's one of those games where you're like, I actually kind of like how you played almost all of these goals. Mm -hmm. It just it just happened, right? Like, but sometimes those games just happen. But we talked about making a couple small adjustments that, like, yes, you got scored on a three-on-one, and yes, it was the back door on the three-on-one, but did you give yourself the best chance on that? Like this, yeah. Right. Like, yes, that's a hard play, but we're going to give that play up a lot. So you need to be able to adjust to that. Yeah. Right. It's just, and it's then, just understanding. It's, un it's just understanding the game and your strengths. And there's a lot, there's a lot to it, but I think we, I think we've covered everything we need to, to co be covered on this. Um, goalies be competent puck handling, yep. be involved in systems meetings yeah. so that you are smart goal. You can think the game. I think that's really kind of the quickest Sparks Notes summary of, or Cliff Notes. Is it Cliff Notes or Spark Notes? Those are both things, Jeremy. Both are websites. Oh, okay. Well, I feel like which one was first? <laughs> I think Cliff Notes is the okay. uh, is So those the are the one. Cliff Notes versions of the pod. The TL, too long, TLDR. Is that what the kids call yep, it? Yep, that's day? the one. Okay. Well, that's not the kids. That's a for sure a boomer saying, so you're old. Oh, I'm such a boomer. Yeah, you are. Jamie, you're, you you overshot the millennial age. Right? I know. I just Jamie, skipped. In your day, you did half split kick saves. That's all you need to know. I, I so I worked with a, a young goalie. He, he was, yeah, so I think he was like a younger goalie, like he's a U12-ish age. And he was like 
kids kids just love reverse half splits meaning like the puck shot to the blocker side and they like kick out their glove leg instead so we just we really worked on extending the 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 blocker leg and it's weird that a lot of goalies have never like been taught that but you don't ha- like i said you don't have to use the half split most goalies don't know what a half split actually is these days you don't have to use it but you should understand you should be able to and you should understand why you need to extend your legs sometimes even if that knee doesn't come off the ice yeah, I mean, it's just body awareness. And that's going to be the same thing for younger goalies. You're you're growing into your body. You're going to have some wacky coordination stuff that happens at points. You might not be aware that it's wacky because you're just it's just your body, but it'll happen. It'll happen. Um, yeah. All right. Well, well otherwise, yeah, James. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for watching, uh, listening. Like, subscribe, uh, leave a rating. You know what? That's a new one. We never really talked about that until Ben brought up that we had a lot of really good ratings. So thank you. So if you really and like what we do. Thank you for everyone leave a rating on, on whatever podcast um, platform you're listening. Uh, let us also let us know in the comments, what you think about puck handling. Is it overrated or not? Because this one might get a little heated. Um, like always, uh, thanks for listening. Subscribe to my Patreon because I actually did offer Ben to get on the payroll a little bit. It's not happening. And it was no one panic. It wasn't Dairy Queen coupon cards. But it's better than inspired the, Dairy Green. Inspired Dairy. No, it's like the uh, the you know the McCafe. Like you get the stickers in Canada for your coffees. <laughs> it's just like a bunch of them they pulled out of the garbage. <laughs> but your free coffee, yeah, six dollars a month in coffee. But honestly, uh, here at the Goalie Science Podcast, we are available for sponsorship. But you should also go subscribe to Jamie's Patreon. But for now, Jamie, until next time. Until next time.